Uh, today is the uh, feast of uh, St. Peter and Paul, so I thought we would start with a prayer taken from the Mass uh, uh, for their vigil Mass. So, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. amen. Grant, we pray, O Lord our God, that we may be sustained by the intercession of the blessed apostles Peter and Paul, that as through them you gave your church the foundations of her heavenly office, so through them you may help her to her eternal salvation. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Well, welcome to uh, Summer School of Faith 2021. We got a little bit of a late start this year for, I don't know why, uh, no, but due to the shutdowns that uh, various groups were uh, abiding by. And so we're starting a little later in the summer, but uh, we'll, we'll certainly complete the program uh, by the end of July. This 2020 would have been a, a nice anniversary of sorts for, for me and my family uh, in that it would have represented our 50th year in the parish. And I can remember as a little kid receiving First Communion, uh, you know, I had a purple blazer on and with a little emblem, and uh, that was 50 some years ago. So uh, that was another thing that the shutdown disrupted was me telling you that on the 50th anniversary, but I'm telling you on the 51st. Uh, this is also the eighth year for Summer School of Faith. So. Uh, and that would be counting the COVID year of 2020. So we've, we've been around for a little bit, not as long as, as my family has been in the parish. The subject for this summer's program is something that I've been kind of thinking about for a while. And in, in past years, we've touched on this topic of, of uh, the title is Water into Wine, Christianity and the Transformation of Culture in a Post-Christian Age because we are living in a post-Christian age at this time in the West. And I've touched on this in past years, uh, but I thought I would go a little deeper into how the ancient paganisms of the past are reappearing now in modern form. Now, I can't look at all of them, so I selected a few of them, but that's the theme of our, our program is really built on these bullet points and headlines. Uh, the decline of uh, Christianity uh, in the West is well documented. I don't believe I have to tell anyone here what's been going on for the last 40 or 50 years, whether it's the, the decline in uh, Catholic attendance at Mass, if it's the closing of schools and even Catholic hospitals, if it's uh, just the general decline in, in general public morality and public policy that influences the culture. Uh, there's just significant evidence among people when they're polled, the number of nuns, no denomination, uh, continues to grow. Uh, and it's certainly well over, uh, it, I believe it's now over 50, 50% in this country of people who do not profess a Christian denomination in any sense largely among younger people, but that number has, the average age has slowly crept up as well. So we're in a, in a moment not unique in the life of the church, certainly, of, of we're a bit at sea, uh, bobbing around in the currents, not controlling our destiny, not finding sure footing uh, in culture, in society. We live in a society that doesn't naturally support Christian values, Judeo-Christian values, like it did in 1955, for example. Other things I note uh, are that modern secular secularism, which we'll just define as uh, life without God, where the only norms of morality are, as long as I'm not hurting someone, then it is permitted. And of course, we don't define who someone is. Uh, particularly if they're under the age of nine months. Uh, also, people tend to think, well, what's wrong with secularism uh, just in itself? Just we, we will defer from making any judgments about the existence of God or about morality. We'll just 
put that aside and create public policy in the absence of those things that we used to call on. You see, that's not a benign position to take like weeds in your garden left untended, if you leave untended the culture of society, you get malignant weeds, uh, policies that are antithetical to the human person or society writ large. And, and again, uh, if you've been a, a reading the papers uh, or aware of what's happening in our culture, you would see how uh, secularism today is actually not a benign force whatsoever. Uh, if going down the list here, and then we're, we'll connect to really the program specifically, uh, Christianity and the people of Israel were actually born into these pagan cultures from the beginning. So there's much to learn from what was at issue when the Judeo-Christian tradition confronted these pagan cultures. And as I mentioned, we can't talk about all of them and we can't even talk about any one of them in significant depth because we could be here all summer just talking about Zoroastrianism or Confucianism. So I have to kind of skip along the surface but to give you enough framework so you know what's at stake and how these things are reappearing today. You might be wondering how does something that's 2,000 years old or 3,000 years old, how does that have anything to do with today. Part of the course program will be to show you how that's happening today in modern form, in modern garb. And then we'll talk about the difference Jesus Christ makes and the difference that Christianity makes to address these pagan uh, things that are in our culture today as clues to how we approach them. And, and the main point I, I hope we take away from this summer is take courage. The church has faced this and much worse in her history. Uh, so hopefully we can take from this program and other things that we're aware of confidence that we actually have a healing mission to this broken world that we live in. And uh, we don't have to build the bunkers just yet, uh, but rather we can confront the culture on the terms that we see it coming at us on. So uh, take courage and uh, what we'll now do is just attempt in, in this class and then the next to talk about how or what is at stake with this clash of ancient pagan cultures and religions coming back into force in the 21st century. So what we'll do in class one, and don't worry, I'll define what axial means. <laughs> not something for your car service at the garage uh, necessarily, though there are parallels. But we'll look at the Far East, and in particular Hinduism and Buddhism. You might say, well, that's something for the people who live in India or Tibet or China. Uh, but did you know there are roughly 42,000 yoga centers in this country uh, and growing? And uh, not to pick on yoga, but it's, it's an emblem of how the cultures on different parts are being informed by new practices that, did you think of yoga class 30 years ago? Maybe not, maybe you did, maybe you were ahead of the game. Um, but it's a multi-billion dollar industry and, and by the year, I believe 2025, it will be about a $70 billion industry throughout the world. So we'll talk about Hinduism and Buddhism and then a critique of it from a Catholic perspective. The class after that will talk about a couple of different groups. Uh, Zoroastrianism, which was the religion of Persia from around uh, 300 BC all the way until Islam. So we're talking about a run of about a thousand years where Zoroastrianism dominated Persia as its religion and we'll see its themes appearing as well. We'll talk about the Middle East, uh, particularly Babylon, the Babylonian religions and gods uh, and the Greeks. And then in class three, we will talk about how Christianity was perceived by the pagans and you'll see many parallels on how the Romans regarded Christianity and how we're regarded today. Uh, so you'll see that the, the parallels will be striking to you. Class four is really 
an important topic of why is Jesus Christ different? And for our money, obviously, the Son of God who reveals the Father. And why that claim is unique in religious history. And you'll, you might be thinking, wait a minute, many people have claimed to be divine. Well, we'll get to what makes Jesus different than any other religious figure. And then finally, uh, be not afraid is the final class. And the headline there speaks to we, have, we are living in a culture and a world that is broken. And it is reaching out for all kinds of remedies that are largely godless. And it's getting more frustrated. We'd be a little nervous if secularism worked, <laughs> if people were happier. But every Gallup poll that attitudinal surveys, uh, people are more unhappy. And the more prosperous they get, the more unhappy they get. Uh, regrettably, teen suicides and young people suicides continue to grow at, at now at double digits of, as a percent of young people. These are not signs that secularism has answers to the questions of the human heart. So that is our runway to evangelize culture once again, and we'll talk about how we do that. So that's our program for the summer. So a nice light subject. <laughs> But as you know, Summer School of Faith is all about making simple subjects complicated and making complicated subjects simple. So you'll see how quickly I'll move through Hinduism and Buddhism. And I tell you at the outset, I'm not doing justice to them in terms of the depth and richness of them, but I'm giving us enough framework to evaluate them. Uh, and, and you'll see what I'm getting at. So what, am, what are we talking about when I say the term axial age or uh, that sort of talk about axial religions? Let me read these quotes to you in case you didn't print your hand out or you can't quite see that text. But I'm quoting from a, a book that I think if you read, you'd find it very fascinating, S. Einstadt, The Origins and Diversity of Axial Age Civilizations. Quote, in the first millennium before the Christian era, a revolution took place in the realm of ideas and their institutional bases, which had irreversible effects on major civilizations and on human history in general. The revolution or series of revolutions, which are related to Karl Jasper's axial age, he's, he's a German philosopher and, and they love their big German sounding words, Oxenzeit, for those who speak German. Uh, but in German words, you always have the compounds that reveal more than the English translation. But axial age has to do with the emergence, conceptualization, and institutionalization of a basic tension between the transcendental and mundane orders. This revolutionary process took place in several major civilizations, including ancient Israel, ancient Greece, early Christianity, Zoroastrian Iran, early imperial China, and the Hindu and Buddhist civilizations. A new type of intellectual elite became aware of the necessity to actively construct the world according to some transcendental vision. The successful institutionalization of such conceptions and visions gave rise to extensive reordering of the internal contours of societies as well as their internal relations. This changed the dynamics of history and introduced the possibility of world history or histories. Now there's a lot there, uh, but what he is pointing to, and I'll, I'll pop to the next page, and it's too bad the map didn't uh, come out nicely, but it would in your handouts, but hopefully you can visualize continents. Uh, but uh, what, uh, what comes out of this, and actually the Wall Street Journal had an article on this not too long ago about what created this condition and in addition to the, the passage I just read about this attempting to harmonize the mundane orders of how do I find food today with this transcendental understanding of the, the world, the universe writ large. Is there something more than just me washing clothes in a river or throwing a spear at a deer? Uh, those mundane and transcendental realms, orders, were harmonized and synthesized in the axial religions, which we're talking about. 
And if you can imagine China and India and then moving into the Middle East of Iran and Persia, Israel, Palestine, Judaism, all the way to Greek philosophy. What we will cover in class one, as I mentioned, is Hinduism and Buddhism. And then we'll move right to left. Another way of thinking about this is a move from cosmological centric thinking and culture, namely man is a cog in a massive universe that doesn't care about him, is a plaything of the gods. His fate is out of his hands and therefore he will do incredible rituals to protect himself or make sure it rains or that he has a family. We move from that cosmological centric thought as we go east to west, a growing centralization of man as a microcosm of a macrocosm. That man in himself has dignity and worth that the cosmos that he is in recognizes. So as we proceed, you'll see that theme. Uh, and so continuing, and it's too bad the map didn't print out, what are the common, what I'll call pre-axial? So these axial religions really occurred after 800 BC all the way to Christianity. And, and so what was going on pre-axial is actually relevant because this is what the axial religions were working with, the raw material of those cultures and societies. They were polytheistic. If you looked at Babylonian creation myths, uh, they often are violent. Uh, man comes from the slaying of a dragon and the blood issues out and man is constructed out of the blood of a dragon. If you look at the Greek myths, some think are prior to 800 BC or even if you look at Homer, uh, it's the sexual actions of Zeus and the fight among the Titans, if you remember those stories from Greek mythology, that are part of the creation of the universe and the godly realm. Violence, sexuality are the basis for it. As a result, what, what comes out of this for the pre-axial cultures prior to 800 BC are rituals, priestly rituals to protect us from the gods, from the whimsy of the gods, to placating them so that we win a battle over that hill against our enemy to making sure it rains, making sure there's a successful harvest, making sure my wife is pregnant with sons and then maybe some daughters uh, and so forth. So cosmic maintenance is the term that's used often in the literature to make sure that our village doesn't fall into an earthquake crack uh, because we saw that happen over there two miles. So when there was no understanding of much, this is what you were often doing with priestly ritual. Lastly, what's interesting is what I call an ontological continuum. What is that? That means the human stuff comes from the divine stuff. There is a continuum in degree, not qualitatively, but gods are just stronger than us. They control more, but we come from them directly in some sense. This will continue in Hinduism and Buddhism as well. And it has continued and morphed in modern garb today, which we'll get to. So I'm giving you teasers so uh, you know what's coming in future classes. But these three pre-axial themes will play out in the axial religions and will play out in modern form today. Carl Jaspers, we might as well quote from him, he wrote a book in 1953 called The Origin and Goal of History. Uh, so after World War II, and uh, you know, Germans are always trying to systematize everything, including history and its goal and its origin. So they have these large ambitions. Uh, I'm German, so I can make fun of Germans. Uh, but in these axial religions, there arose a conscious effort as I mentioned earlier, to rationalize the relationship between the mundane stuff, avoiding earthquakes, harvests, large families, and the transcendent order, what is outside and larger than myself. And leaders sought to construct the world in some holistic vision. Let me read this quote. 
The most extraordinary events are concentrated in this period from around 800 B.C. to 1000 B.C. and up to the time of Christ. Confucius and Lao Tzu were living in China. All the schools of Chinese philosophy came into being. India produced the Upanishads and Buddha and like China ran the whole gamut of philosophical possibilities down to skepticism, to materialism, Sophism and nihilism. In Iran, Zarathustra taught a challenging view of the world as a struggle between good and evil. We'll, we will get to that in class too, how innovative that thought was. In Palestine, the prophets made their appearance from Elijah by way of Isaiah and Jeremiah. Greece witnessed the appearance of Homer, the philosophers, Parmenides, Heraclitus, Plato, of the Tragedians, Thucydides, and Archimedes. Everything implied by these names developed during these few centuries and simultaneously in China, India, and the West without any one of these regions knowing of the others. So it's kind of fascinating, this concentration of spiritual energy that occurred. And the three things that are probably left out are what were the economic and cultural things that allowed this explosion of, of spiritual energy? And it's probably a handful that we would think of if we thought about it. One is having sufficient wealth and leisure time to think about it. <laughs> if you are constantly concerned with where am I getting water and food today, how am I going to feed my family, or they're going to die, and by the way, three have died in childbirth already, and the average life expectancy was 35, and, and, and. So leisure, there has to be a sufficient amount of wealth produced at the very top, which is what would happen, so that those elites had time to think about what is going on. Another is literacy at that level. You had to be able to write stuff down and share it. Now, interestingly, in some religions, nothing was written down for quite a while, uh, and then later was written down. But there has to, for these axial religions to take off, there has to be literacy. And so, Really, those two questions, a common language that people could communicate in and economic advancement for the elite so they had time to think about these things would be the other things we would think of and mention. So with that, uh, one last long quote, but you will, you will see more flesh put on what Carl Jaspers is after. What is new about this age in all three areas of the world is that man becomes conscious of being as a whole of himself and his limitations. He experiences the terror of the world and his own powerlessness. He asks radical questions. Face to face with the void, he strives for liberation and redemption. In this age were born the fundamental categories within which we still think today. And the beginnings of the world religions by which human beings still live were created. The step into universality was taken in every sense. The mythical age, with its tranquility and self-evidence, was at an end. The Greek, Indian, and Chinese philosophers were unmythical in their decisive insights, as were the prophets in the ideas of God. Rationality and rationally clarified experience launched a struggle against the myth, logos against mythos. Logos is a Greek word meaning rationality or word or thought. A further struggle developed for the transcendence of the one God against non-existent demons. And finally, an ethical rebellion took place against the unreal figures of the gods. Religion was rendered ethical, and the majesty of the deity thereby increased. To sum up, the conception of the axial period furnishes the questions and standards with which to approach all preceding and subsequent developments. The outlines of the preceding civilizations dissolve. The people that bore them vanish from sight as they join in the movement of the axial period, which assimilates everything that remains. From it, world history receives the only structure and unity that has endured, at least until our own time. So ultimately, man is in search of transcendence, of universality, of a sense of being as a whole, not just my individual life, or the group next door, or the wonder of nature, but man seeks a totality to have meaning. And that is what the axial age is describing and advancing. So what we will do is look at these.
And because man is in search of the transcendent, when he doesn't find it from our perspective in the one true living God, he will find it somewhere else. Uh, in history, for Marx, in our time, uh, the, what I call the sacred self or the autonomy of the self, the sovereign self you'll sometimes hear about, that's really the new religion in the West and in the United States. The self, the autonomous self, in its own dignity, constitutes itself in all value. So that's how these things come full circle. Okay. A little less text now. I promise less quotes, small print. So this anxiety about death is what gives rise to this period and liberation in the search for meaning. Increased urbanization, as, as we touched on this, uh, became uh, a source of conflict from people who didn't live in the cities versus those that did. Uh, this rapid social change, which I'll point to in a few moments, uh, created upheavals. There is this move in the Axial Age from the priestly ritual to promote harvests and fertility uh, and to avoid dangers to personal transformation. The priestly ritual that just speaks to those issues and doesn't touch on me is what's getting questioned. And so personal transformation, personal redemption becomes more important. And in fact, the whole sense of I. If in the pre-axial time, and we don't want to be too rigid with the cutoff, obviously, uh, but your sense of your identity as a separate self was not necessarily something uh, present, actually. You were part of a clan. You were part of a family. Your identity was in the perpetuation of the family, the clan, the village. In some sense, you had no identity apart from that. We tend to think, oh, no, people have always thought like we thought about ourselves. No, they did not. And you can see this as they dig up more things in archaeology. Uh, and so this liberation from suffering and death and the search for meaning uh, creates this axial tension that we see. Let's talk then about, uh, oh, good, that map comes through. Uh, what are we talking about when we talk about, let's not talk about Hinduism, but the pre-axial migration of people. And so if you r recall your, your uh, reading of maps, uh, in history there was a major migration that historians and scholars who run around these areas and dig up artifacts talk about. Around 1500 BC, two groups came from the north and proceeded southeast. They hit the base of the Caspian River. One group went left and the other group went right. The group that went left ultimately settled in India, and specifically the Indus Valley. And <clears throat> I don't know if this, uh, let's see if this works. If you look at this word, Ayavarta, it's Sanskrit for uh, the Indo-Aryan population that went toward the Ganges River. And that means in Sanskrit, the noble ones. As a historical reference, it's also where the swastika came from that Hitler eventually co-opted. The group that banked to the right, Aryana, is an old Persian word for the noble ones and is the basis for the word Iran. So we'll get to this group in class two. We're just going to talk about the group that said, ah, we like uh, the weather pattern <laughs> in this migration, so we're going to bank left. Okay. So this group, as I, as I just mentioned, populated Afghanistan. There are very old archaeological sites in Afghanistan, some of which unfortunately have been destroyed, and India. And they settled in this Indus Valley, which is right along the Ganges River. It's interesting how major religions settle on rivers. We'll, we'll get to that if there's time. So the Indus culture that maybe you've heard about uh, is where this group 
originally settled. The, the point, though, is they already met a culture there, as we'll see. And, in, and I'll buzz through these quickly, but these are all pre-1500 B.C. cities in the Indus Valley. And there are roughly 70 cities like this that s the archaeologists think about 50,000 people lived in each city. So an area the size of Texas had about 3.5 million people in it by around 1,000 B.C. Now, this is after the Mesopotamian and Sumer societies, which was the cradle of civilization in quotes. But this has been neglected in, in history, generally taught, but there was a significant Indus population there. These are now famous if you're a Hindu or a Buddhist. The, the Lingam Yonis, in fact, those are all in every Shiva temple that I saw when I was in Bangkok in China. This symbol is central. It's a, it's a, it's a, a symbol of balance, of, of sexuality, of the balance between man and woman. And it's in, uh, I, I, I want to say it's in the, uh, the Vishnu temples, if I said something. But you see, <coughs> excuse me, you see lots of male uh, and female, but more female images like this that they've dug up in the, in the Indus culture. Again, promoting fertility, sexuality. Uh, we tend to think, oh, that's maybe pornographic. In no way did they think that was pornographic. It was really about, can I have some kids, please, God, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, bathhouses all over the place in these towns. And on the walls of these bathhouses, again, you see hopes for a good, uh, not only harvest, but the cattle uh, might grow in, in number. Uh, and other markings on the bathhouse. So this is where we are, and it's the link to the rise of classical Hinduism. So I mentioned that just so these things don't just pop out of the air. They get a running start, and Hinduism grafted on top of the Indus culture. So uh, just to summarize then, between 1500 and 800 uh, BC, uh, you have this migration occur and a move. And this period is called the Vedic period, 1500 to 800 BC. It's polytheistic. You have the Vedas as, as scriptural texts that emerge that will inform Hinduism. Uh, there's a priestly class of Brahmins. There are roughly 33 gods and goddesses that are invoked for help. Uh, there's this close association, as I've said, between the sexual and fertility rites. Uh, of the time. No reincarnation at this point. Uh, no sense of human destiny linked to human action or, or moral, moral choices. So the ground was ripe for Hinduism to come in. We are only going to look at classical Hinduism in this review. Uh, there are many forms of Hinduism. And uh, for the, the group here in the YouTube crowd who will write comments, um, I'm only looking at classical Hinduism per se, but it provides a sufficient framework for what we're going to talk about. So this is the heart of classical Hinduism, and it's what Buddha will take up as his central problem as well, so it's relevant. But the decline, as I mentioned, of the Vedic period, which was between 1500 and 800 BC, that pre-axial Indus Valley culture, was taken over by Hinduism, which sought to give meaning or explanation to how do we move from priestly ritual controlling a cosmic pantheon of gods to dealing with the individual and personal meaning. This is where we see an explosion of what we might call the monks, the ascetic seekers who left everything behind to find the true way. And so this the Upanishads get written th at this time, the critical early text of Hinduism. But this wheel is central to Hinduism and, and the problem that Buddha wants to solve. And so in the text, uh, we see something called this wheel, that moral choices are linked to this wheel. The soul is immortal, but it's on a wheel of reincarnation. And this is where reincarnation is being introduced. 
And as a result, they, they have three words to describe our condition on this wheel that moves to reincarnated selves. What's called moksha, which is this equanimity or stoicism toward the impermanence and suffering of life, the changes, the disappointments, the ups and downs, called moksha. And it's unavoidable. Every human life partakes of this. The next segment is samsara. This relates to the suffering that we face. So moksha is our posture of stoicism toward it, that I'm not going to let it rattle me. Samsara is the suffering that is endemic to human life. These people don't hold back. <laughs> There's no happy talk yet. Karma is the word we most hear about today. And think of it as the elevator between your levels of reincarnation. Based upon your actions, you go up or down <laughs> and across all created reality, living created reality. And so karma is this absolute cosmic justice that's impersonal in that it's just looking at how did you conduct yourself or how did fate treat you. And this wheel continues. And Hinduism struggles to answer how get off the wheel. But the wheel is real and reincarnation is real. So as, as we continue, in classical Hinduism, this is distinct from the pietistic devotional Hinduism of the gods. Uh, there is no dualism. There is no distinction between you and whatever else there is. All is one in some sense. Uh, and there could be a self because some Hindu texts speak of a permanent self. But what we have to appreciate as Catholics is there is no pope of Hinduism. There is no pope of Buddhism who says, this is how it is. Or the bishop united with the pope. There is no central authority. And so as we will see, there's a splintering that takes effect uh, immediately. The rise of piety among the Hindus creates this even larger pantheon of gods. Uh, and they are distinct from us. So it breaks through that no dualism uh, to a dualistic understanding of the universe. But classical Hinduism would not acknowledge that necessarily. So, as an example, uh, these are the key gods of Hinduism in that devotional set. Vishnu, Brahma, and Shiva. And it's Shiva that that Lingam Yani is in their temples. And then Ganesha is the elephant. If you you may not have even ever heard of these before, but Ganesha is the remover of obstacles. There's always a story in every Hindu uh, text behind this. So I think it was either Shiva or Vishnu had a son and its head was cut off. And the wife of Vishnu said, please restore our son. And he says, okay, the first thing I see will be his head. Well, <coughs> the first thing he saw was an elephant. And so that's why Ganesha has an elephant head. But this devotion to these gods continues to this day. And uh, it, it actually is a way of thinking about the universe with gods and the self as distinct. So continuing, <clears throat> this brings us up to Buddhism. And we're a little more certain of when the Buddha, uh, Siddhartha Gautama, which the Buddha means the awakened one. Any connections to wokeness? We'll, we'll see that in later classes how this plays out. But you see how the ground was fertile for as the West embraces one of the themes that I'm developing is that we have embraced the basic spiritual center of Eastern religion in our culture, perhaps without knowing it. Uh, but Wokeism in the political vocabulary has a relationship to uh, Buddhism in culture. But anyway, somewhere in the fifth century, uh, Buddha became one of these ascetic wanderers. He left his family, his wife, his child to seek, how do I get off the wheel of moksha, samsara, and karma? 
How do we get off the wheel? And he sought revolution to the problem of samsara by enunciating four noble truths. The disease is life is suffering, so uh, no, no real change there, but he's acknowledging that it's impermanence, change, the flux, the vagaries, the outrageous fortunes of slings and arrows is life is suffering. The causes are our desires and cravings, our expectations, uh, and the attachments that that creates, as I mentioned. The cure is the overcoming of desire as such that can end suffering. And the ongoing uh, remedy is achieving an, an awareness, uh, an enlightenment, an awakening uh, that to maintain this nirvana, this non-suffering posture, we have to overcome our sense of ourselves being separate from the rest of the universe. That all is one and that uh, we can end being on the wheel by obliterating our desires that are based upon something, if I can only have that outside of myself, I will be happy. Now, that's actually a, a powerful insight. We, we, in some ways, wouldn't have any problem with that uh, at all. And, and a healthy spirituality does express that no thing except the living God <laughs> can satisfy the human heart. We will get to the assessment of this later, but there is a, a appreciation we should have for this insight uh, in itself. There are problems with how, but overcoming our sense of ourselves as something distinct from the things that I crave is the source of my suffering. If I, I can overcome that and achieve a oneness with all things, I will end my reincarnation cycles. Just a few pictures uh, to, to break up uh, the conversation a little bit, but you'll see Buddha statues in different forms. There are hundreds and hundreds of different depictions of Buddha. Uh, a common one is, you know, eyes shut because there's nothing outside of me that I want, uh, and and a hand touching toward the ground that all is one. So I am not distinct from anything around me. So eyes closed, inward focus. You, you contrast this, I, I just, it flits into my mind. If you look at the early uh, cave paintings of Christians, the eyes are wide open. Be awake, wait for Jesus, vision, sight, rationality. It's, it's a striking contrast of how the art is. Buddhist depictions are inward, silent, uh, eyes closed. As Christians are eyes open, aware, curious, looking. Uh, Buddha was thought to have been born in Lubini, Nepal. It's a massive uh, statue uh, there. Uh, there. There are two core values of, of the morality of Buddhism. Uh, of compassion for all and non-harm for all, which I think we can admire uh, as a spiritual uh, uh, precept. The, the problem is the gap between the precepts and policy on the ground. And you think of the obvious example of the Tibetan monks uh, in 1950 were slaughtered by Mao. They, they were pacifists. Uh, people don't realize this, but close to a million Tibetans were killed in, 19, in the early 1950s. Probably uh, 6,000 monasteries were leveled. Uh, and so you see how there will, there's always this gap between Buddhist philosophy or spirituality and can I defend myself? <laughs> Is there a social justice uh, ethos that emerges? like it did in Christianity? Um, no, there wasn't. That's one of the distinctive features and uh, cultural values of the West is the move from Christianity to public policy in ways that Eastern religions never did. 
you know, it was evangelical Christians who abolished uh, slavery in the West. Evangelical white Christians abolished the, abolished the slave trade. Okay, so let's just get to the heart of, of Buddhism, and then we'll move to a, uh, a, a critique. So reality is change. There is no substantial self, anatman in Sanskrit, considered as such. The self is really just a convergence of forces, of realms, like uh, a rainbow after a thunderstorm. It's, a rainbow is a convergence of things that happen around it. And you, as a self, is a misapprehension. You're just a convergence of stuff. And as, as I put it here, there's, we try to seek these false stabilizations to give ourselves comfort and not face the fact that you are the one with everything. There is no distinct self. It's a very Eastern idea. And there are different ways that we conceptualize that block nirvana and this enlightenment. There's thought but no thinker. There's feeling but no feeler. And our, as I put it there, our mental habit to make permanent things out of things that are inherently changing is the source of our suffering. We're constantly trying to lay hold of things and think they're outside of ourselves. I've, I view Buddhism as a kind of deconstruction of Hinduism. We move from Atman, soul, in Hinduism to Anatman, no self. We move from Brahman, which was the priestly caste in Hinduism, to Brahman, which is what absolute reality is beyond all conceptualization, which we are. And if you recall the Joseph Campbell series with uh, the PBS, uh, I'm, I'm gonna for, uh, forget his name, Moyers. Bill Moyers and Joseph Campbell did a whole PBS show and I wanna say in the 70s or 80s on Buddhism. And one of the conclusions that uh, Joseph Campbell, who was Catholic but Buddhist in his thinking, was you, one of his headlines, you are the transcendence you seek. You have to leave home to find home. <laughs> and he was a large proponent of, of if we can only see that we're all one, uh, we would solve a lot of the problems in our daily lives and in the, in the world. Now, of course, there's a sense in which that's true, and there's a sense in which distinctions have to be made, one of them being, well, no, we are individuals. <laughs> and we have a destiny uh, that's individual and corporate. All right, this will be the last page on Hinduism or in Buddhism, and then we'll get to the critique. So as I mentioned, there's not one religion here. There's not one philosophy here amidst Hinduism and Buddhism. As a quick example, there are over 18 different sects of, uh, of Buddhism within 200 years of Buddha's death, 18 or more actually. There were no, no scriptures written down until 500 years after his death. So there was a very robust oral tradition among the monks to keep these stories going and alive. But it does raise a, a question of how reliable these stories are to the historical Buddha. Um, the first archaeological digs of Buddha statues is around you know, 100 A.D., the first century A.D. So, as I mentioned here, in the end, Buddhism is many things, actually. It's a meditative centering technique, which is very popular, uh, where you begin to withdraw from yourself and find a, a kind of empty space uh, by which you then can meditate from absence. And by meditating from absence, you then begin to break down these distinctions we make between ourselves and what we desire and, and discover an enlightened path. It, it's this philosophy of oneness of creation for some people. It's general principles of uh, compassion and do no harm. Um, and 
those principles we could all agree with. The, the, the question always becomes then the implementation of them in this situation. Um, and uh, what's interesting about the history of Buddhism is um, all of the United Nations human rights talk of in 1948, the Universal Declaration, uh, and what preceded it, whether it's the outlawing of slavery, the dignity of the individual, the dignity of women, are all uh, Western initiatives. I, I hate to be uh, this way about it, but these were not coming, and it could be historical, communist China wasn't exactly promoting the dignity of the individual and human rights. Uh, nevertheless, all of the universal laws around the rights of indigenous populations started with the Catholic colonists in South America. How do we treat the people we come in contact with after they've been ravaged and beaten up and murdered by Western settlers? But then the reflection came of, wait a minute, uh, they have rights too. They are human beings. If we're going to baptize them, then they have the full menu of rights of human beings. Somehow that kind of push to public policy never occurred in the East. So one of the remarkable things about Western civilization is its universality, capital U. Okay, so with this, let's do an assessment. The first one is influencing the transcendent order through our actions. And this comes largely through the meditative practices, the enlightened path. I can get off the wheel of reincarnation. Probably the larger one is what I call the lurking dualism in the idea of reincarnation. Your body is a mere vehicle, mere tool for your true self, which is spiritual if it exists. So the body is throwaway. The body can be manipulated. The body is just a rent-a-car. And we know how people treat rent-a-cars. <laughs> You've ever gone to the airport and you've picked out your your vehicle and maybe they forgot to clean it or 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 uh, it's a mess. And if you believe in reincarnation, then your body is just a vehicle and, and maybe you're not in such a hurry to push uh, common good policy because we'll just start it again next time. So uh, this lurking dualism, as you know, will show up in our culture today. As, as I put it here, the tattoo culture, bodies, mere canvas, just, it's not a temple of the Holy Spirit. It's just a canvas for me to do self-advertisement on. Now, I'm not making fun of people who have tattoos. I'm talking about the conditions for the possibility of a culture to produce tattoos. Forty years ago, did people have tattoos to the extent they have today? No, why not? That's what I'm talking about. The culture that views the body as a mere canvas for self-expression, the sovereign self, body as rent-a-car, is open, available, interested in tattoos. That's the point. We've seen this in the gender fluidity uh, that is occurring now. Uh, my sex is... Uh, provisional, can be changed like a hobby, uh, and so on. And the alternative sexualities that we're seeing uh, that uh, fumble with the levers of life uh, for joy and pleasure and all those things that lead to lasting happiness, which is why the population that uh, exhibits those behaviors tends to have a higher suicide rate than the general population. But we can't talk that way today because that would imply we care about those people. Because society doesn't care about those people. It just cares about the choice itself, the power of choice. That's what's important. Consequences, no. It's time for rent cars and going 90 miles an hour. Okay. Next uh, slide then is this fundamental ontological continuum, which I mentioned earlier, the anatman to Brahman, the no-self to the cosmic principle beyond conceptualization. This fundamental continuum that we are on with 
whatever is transcendent, which is part and parcel of Hinduism, classically understood, and Buddhism, shows up today in the sovereign self. What was located as transcendent has now been located in the self and its desires and its will and its choices. So the West has mangled because in fairness to Buddhism, the, the monks in Tibet would not recognize the Buddhism that's common in the West as being authentic. They, they have overcome their desires by lifelong celibacy, by restrictive diets, by living in poverty. And that's the classical Buddhism that never uh, changed. Whereas Buddhism in the West today is available for this religion of self to be mangled and morphed and changed into, I'm going to meditate to get in touch with what I want. <laughs> the autonomous self. So Buddhism satis satisfies, I, I put in parentheses in, in kind of a joking way, chloroforms the lungs of the soul by obliterating the search for permanence in the first place. Your search for permanence is a cop-out, according to the Buddha. You're seeking something outside of yourself to make yourself happy. And your search is a barrier to achieving true nirvana. So we hear the slogans today. Again, these don't come from nowhere. Mindfulness. Live life with intention. Stating your truth. Best version of myself. Have you heard these? Am I, yeah, you've all heard these. Where do you think they come from? This subtle, implicit, sweet summons of Buddhism in the West. Woke, as we already talked about. But of course, this Eastern focus on means, on qualitative posture, evades the question. What is true? What is good? What is beautiful? It evades the question. It's talking about qualitative techniques, do no harm, compassion, but what is good in itself? What is true in itself? What is beautiful? That's a problem. And that's why there's no social policy that comes developed out of Buddhism. Continuing this, as I mentioned, Buddhism offers techniques for well-being, like meditation and a proper diet. But taken as a whole, it's really a, I call it a deformed, reduced worldview of the human person. By confusing physical techniques to manage life's anxieties with a holistic explanation of the human person. Namely, purpose, destiny. Ends always start the show. Last in execution, first in intention. If you're building a home, you better start with a good drawing, a good design of what you want the home to look like. Then you go and find the building materials. Then you go find your fixtures. But you've already designed what you want it to be. Last in execution, first in intention. Ends, purpose, destiny. Buddhism evades that question and just focuses on methods, techniques. That's a problem. It's a fallacy of, I think I was in kind of a philosophical logic mode, but it's a fallacy of composition. And this fallacy shows up in different things, so I wanted to draw it to you. But what's true of a part, namely, meditation does calm you is true of the whole. Therefore, the human person's destiny is about techniques, not talking about purpose. So the example given in the logic books is, it's helpful to wear shoes when you go walking. Therefore, the purpose of walking is to go to the shoe store. It's a fallacy of composition. And you hate to reduce major axial religions to fallacies, but un unfortunately, that's what we're, we're dealing with here it's on some level. Buddhism negates the distinction between transcendence and imminence. The what's ahead and out there that's above us, greater than us, infinite, and me, and my experience. 
it compresses them into what I call this fabricated piece of soul, the spiritual nihilism, means without ends, as I have been mentioning. It's Nirvana is the absence of struggle. But why should we think the absence of struggle is our purpose? No one ever raised that question. As I call it here, a self-annihilation. A spiritual lobotomy to achieve peace, the tranquility of a morgue, is how I put it. Here. And, and this, it, this is edgy, but it's it, important how this can be. And then I have the quote from Woody Allen uh, when he was being interviewed. I'm not interested in being immortal from my films. I would rather be immortal from my life. <laughs> in other words, I want to live forever, and I want to be happy forever. And there's nothing wrong with me wanting that. So there's this, even in a secularist, there's kind of this plaintive cry of, if you want to annihilate the self, I'm not really pleased about that. I kind of like myself. I know I've got problems, but I'd like to make progress and struggle and achieve. Just continuing on, uh, Buddhism, and this is a problem that all absolute relativisms make. You might say, what is that? Good grief. But it is the coin of the realm in our society today. Uh, namely, that there are no such things as absolutes in morality. <laughs> or if you think about that for a moment, is that a moral proposition that I just made? Is it absolutely true? So these, self, these are self-referential fallacies that occur whenever someone says there are no absolutes. <laughs> Do they mean that absolutely? <laughs> so Buddhism, from a philosophical point of view, says you cannot make any permanent, enduring conceptualizations of what is true. Ultimate reality is beyond conceptualization. And we would agree with a lot of that. But about everything? Can't we say something valid and true about some things that is permanently true? So Buddhism actually, as I put it here, ends where Greek philosophy in its serious moments begins. How do I understand change and permanence? How do I understand the one and the many? So we say there's a human nature which is one, and yet it's participated by many. How do we understand that? That's what the Greeks were thinking about. They didn't deny that there was a difference. They sought to explain the difference. One of the differences between the West and the East. We, we can, we'll go on. That, and I'm not talking about technology, because people say quickly, ah, the Chinese were ahead of us in medieval times, technologically speaking. Technology has little to do with wisdom, and that's what I'm talking about philosophically. As I mentioned earlier, Buddhism has morphed into providing this what I call spiritual veneer for secular humanists and this culture of the sovereign self because I can use those techniques, give myself the whiff of spirituality while still validating what I want to do anyway from the first instance. So Buddhism is handy in the West uh, to give me a sense of, of, you know, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Because religion divides, the spirit unites. And so I can get away with that talk for a while, and Buddhism is a very handy method, uh, given, as I mentioned, there's about 41,000 yoga centers in the U.S. alone now. Uh, it's a very handy way of navigating and running from God. And just to summarize then, this detachment uh, that Buddhism seeks, this nirvana, uh, which requires mindfulness and compassion, is admirable. So I don't want to throw the bathwater out with the baby. But uh, what I'm getting at is Detachment and liberation from what? For what? For what? What am I being liberated for? 
Why am I det detaching from something for what? For nirvana? For obliteration? Seems like a long run for a short slide to me. <laughs> but there's many things we can admire about the Buddhist techniques of meditation and compassion. And in meditation, there is a superficial analogy to Christian prayer. We, we shouldn't pretend that that's not the case. Uh, if you're like me, I get distracted easily in prayer. Uh, I'll, it, it takes uh, sometimes 10, 15 minutes just to calm everything down, to, to be quiet, <laughs> to turn the mind off a little bit, and to be ready to pray to God. So we would acknowledge that and admire that in Buddhism. The issue is we pray to make contact with the living and true God, Jesus Christ, the saints, the communion of saints. The Buddhist does meditation to withdraw. No contact. So that's kind of a big difference. <laughs> okay. So other implications now for Catholicism. Our own Catholic evangelization has been influenced by this, and how could it not be? And in fact, in every time, uh, Catholicism is influenced by the culture that it's in. When culture gets sick, the church catches a cold. And so this, how has it affected us? Over the last 30 or 40 years or more, uh, you could go back to the modernist movement, frankly, of the early 20th century, latter part of the 19th century, this emphasis on the imminence of God in the soul. So now I'll use Catholic vocabulary now. <laughs> but toward the end of the 19th century, into the 20th, there was this interest in making Catholic life and the spiritual life less externally focused on the sacraments, let's say, and more on my experience of grace. So rather than reducing Catholic, and there's much of this we could agree with, Let's not reduce Catholic life to merely participating in the sacraments. What's the common question people might ask of, were you baptized? Are you Catholic? That's the question. Were you baptized? You see how, of course, that's theologically correct. <laughs> if you're not baptized, you're not Catholic. But implicit in it is a reduction of being Catholic to being baptized. Or do you, do you attend Mass? Are you a practicing Catholic in the sense of going to Mass on Sunday? And of course, that is appropriate because practicing Catholics attend Mass on Sunday and non-practicing Catholics do not. But in that, emphasis is a tendency to reduce being Catholic to going to Mass on Sunday. So this movement toward imminence is to say, can we not fill out the Catholic spiritual movement more in our theology with, from the ground up, from our experience of grace in our lives so that we just don't reduce it to sacramental moments. And that is a valid concern. The issue with the modernists is they said that also can replace dogma. <laughs> so the problem is reducing the Catholic faith to your experience of it. So this is one of the influences of Buddhism and Eastern thought generally is we have so emphasized who Jesus is for me who God is for me, that what results often is a functional atheism away from God. We've reduced God to my digestion, <laughs> my big toe. And so uh, that's a problem. Now, we don't want our faith and a life of grace to be just externally focused either, compliance with ritual. We want to live our faith every day. And so the two are balanced in Catholic theology, but we're talking about cultural emphases here. And so Eastern thought, and we hear this in homilies across many different parishes, many dioceses, you'll hear a homily on, let's say, a feast of Christ the King or a feast on Corpus Christi. And you will hear nothing about 
the dogma of the Eucharist. <laughs> You'll hear, how do you make Jesus present in your life? Now, that's an appropriate question. But that is fueled by reception of Holy Communion. Mother Teresa would go to Mass every morning and spend an hour before the tabernacle in prayer, and then she went out into the world and pulled the poor and dead bodies off the street of Calcutta. How could she do that? And she could do that because she said, I spent an hour with Jesus every morning, and then I saw him in everyone I met. That is the perfect synthesis of the imminent and the transcendent. The transcendent sacraments of our faith put into action imminently in our lives. So the two have this beautiful synthesis in the lives of the saints and the lives of holy men and women. But by this emphasis, this Eastern emphasis on imminentism, our experience of God, we, we in a way obscure the wonder of the incarnation, which came from without. It was not our idea. We couldn't have guessed it. And the utter gratuitousness of God's grace, his power to redeem us from sin and death. So this Eastern emphasis, which has kind of traveled into our evangelization, has made us lose our sense of wonder about how strange it is that God came into the world and redeemed us. As I mentioned in the bottom bullet point, it's, it's precisely the fact that God is infinite, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, that he can save us <laughs> and that make having him our highest possibility. If God wasn't separate from us and infinite, would you go through all the heartache <laughs> to be faithful? I don't think I wouldn't. It would be ridiculous. It's precisely that he's other from us, infinite, beautiful, majestic, all-powerful, all-loving, that make having him worthwhile, <laughs> a good thing to spend your time on. And in the incarnation, the dilemma of the Eastern religions, the imponderables of Greek philosophy are finally bridged in Jesus Christ. He is the bridge to the divine. He is what he signifies. He's not a doctrine. He's not a set of noble truths. Here's the truth. What did Jesus say? I am the truth. I am real food, real drink. I am the way. Our faith is in a person who did things that no one else could do unless they were God. That's the difference. He builds the bridge. C.S. Lewis has an interesting uh, analogy of people who don't like this kind of talk. Of This seems a bit uh, much. Seems it limits my freedom if there's a God above and me below and uh, I'm uncomfortable with that. And, and he compares that to someone who's drowning in a river and his rescuer uh, reaches into the river to save them but keeps one firm foot firmly on the bank. And if you were in the river drowning, would you say, hey, that's not fair, you have a foot on the bank. <laughs> so too, if we resent God being divine, <laughs> you, you're, you're going to drown in the river. <laughs> and you are really cutting your legs off. Your sense of autonomy is based upon me having a foot on the bank. So, too, our salvation is assured because God is divine and you are not. <laughs> so, we as Catholics affirm gloriously the real distinction between God and man. And to achieve it, I don't have to erase myself through Eastern techniques. I don't have to obliterate the self or view my body as an appendix. God saves me as a human being, as a soul-body composite. Best thing in town. I don't have to lop things off to be acceptable, whether in meditation or in yoga. I can be saved as a human being. Whereas the Eastern approach was, you ha the world is an alien place, and you are a stranger unto yourself. 
Okay. Last slide. And then we can open up for questions. John Paul II, St. John Paul II, wrote a work, Crossing the Threshold of Hope, uh, in 2003. It was published shortly before he uh, passed away. And uh, he has a chapter on Buddhism. As he, and of course I, I just piggyback off of much smarter people than myself, but when I read this maybe 15 years ago, I thought he's onto something because he takes on Buddhism, Islam, and other faiths in that, in that book. It's a thin paperback. And here's his assessment of Buddhism, which I wanted to share with you. Um, the Buddhist doctrine of enlightenment, this awakening, all is one. Obliteration of the self as one with everything is a negative soteriology. Soteriology is the theology of salvation. So it has a negative theology of salvation, namely the rejection of the world as alien to us in itself. The world is something to be overcome. The world is something to be uh, abbreviated, pushed away. We do not free ourselves from evil through the good that comes from God, but through detachment. And again, detachment for what? He contrasts it with Carmelite spirituality, which is uh, a spirituality that John Paul was very partial to. Uh, he wrote his doctoral thesis on uh, St. John of the Cross uh, and specifically about Carmelite spirituality, uh, like 1946. And he comments that Catholic mysticism begins where Buddhist enlightenment ends, just as Greek philosophy began where Buddhist philosophy ended. So too, Catholic mysticism begins where Buddhist enlightenment ends. What does he mean by that? Well, in Carmelite spirituality, it also advocates for uh, self-denial, detachment. And St. John of the Cross wrote many chapters on the dark night of the soul, the dark night of the senses as a means of true communion with the, uh, the living eternal flame of love. So detachment in, in, in the Catholic sense means detachment for union and love of God and neighbor. There's the story of St. Francis, which I may mention in past years, where he was undergoing one of his severe fasts where he wouldn't eat for days and was in a hut where he was living at the time and he hadn't eaten but he was he was on a fast and a stranger came by who had been traveling and was hungry and came into the hut and said do you have any food and and St. Francis says yes I do and he ate with the stranger he broke his fast and the point of that story is that detachment, self-denial, is for love. It's not an end in itself. It's for liberation of the self, for union with God and neighbor. Whereas in Eastern religion, detachment is an end in itself. There is no payoff, quote-unquote. There is no union with love or the living true God. That's a big difference. Lastly, the Pope remarked that Western civilization built on Judeo-Christian foundations is marked by a positive approach to the world that is not God. If all is one in Buddhist thought or Eastern thought, there is no such distinction. Everything is supposed to be overcome. But the West is founded on this positive approach to the world that is not God based upon the fundamental distinction between creation and the creator. There's a distinction and there's a congeniality. Just because they're separate doesn't mean they're alien. Stewards of creation, be fruitful and multiply. Sciences, the arts, technology, literature, human flourishing. So the Pope is recognizing 
beyond uh, theological and spiritual differences that are significant, there's also a posture toward the world that is different. The West is marked by this positive approach to the world, which actually characterizes its history. And so that, just an interesting insight based upon this distinction between creation and the creator. So that's the result of the, the prepared comments for tonight. Let me open it up for questions. Well, um, as long as uh, I can remember when we were opening manufacturing facilities in Shenzhen, which is in the southeast province of China, just outside of Hong Kong, uh, one of the facilities that I visited was a vendor, uh, a supplier, and at the top of the entrance of the factory was a crucifix. <laughs> and, and I asked the factory owner, uh, how, how, how are you getting away with this? And he said, well, the local mayor said, you can do whatever you want, just don't be political. Uh, you can pray in there, you can do whatever you want, but uh, if you start agitating or evangelizing broadly, uh, that will be the end of that. And so, always be surprised by the local people working something out. No, no you're not. As, as Buddhism traveled east and north, it became more innovative. And uh, whereas in the South, like uh, Burma, Myanmar, uh, even Tibet uh, has innovative aspects to it, um, Thailand in the South was more classical Buddhism. Um, uh, but you, you also have a, a, a pietistic devotional overlay as well in some of those cultures uh, in, in that practice Buddhism also. So as it moved, and it gets back to, there is no one Buddhism. Uh, and there are local varieties that do have a more public face to them uh, than classical Buddhism as the monks practiced it in Nepal. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, it, it gets back to, you know, the catechism. You know, what is the purpose of my life? To know, love God in this world, to be with him in the next. Serve him and to be with him in the next. So. In this and the next. Right. Right. It starts now. starts now. Right. Yeah, the, the afterlife, uh, I've always felt that it's, it will be obviously beyond anything we can even experience. Right. Yeah. Um, but it still has to be me there. Right. Good. Our, our next class then, we will focus on the Near East and the Greeks and the themes present there that show up in culture today. And by the way, uh, and then Israel, and how obviously the faith of Israel uh, in the Old Testament and Greek philosophy are useful to the Catholic faith. Obviously, the Old Testament is useful. <laughs> well, good. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We'll see you next week.